Free speech. Without it, you aren't free. Welcome to the Canadian Shield. My name is Sterling. I'm your host. Now, I told you at the beginning of this video that without freedom of speech, you do not have any freedom. And I hold to that contention. And I will forever hold to that contention. Because without the ability to disagree, without the ability to speak your mind, you are only limited to what the other individual is giving you the permission to say. You are only well, any of a, a, you know, a thousand dictatorships that we can mention throughout the history or, th or on this planet where people are suppressed, where their language is suppressed, where they're not allowed to speak the truth. And as a result, their life and livelihoods suffer. As a result, they get on rafts and sail to other countries. They, they, you know, they, they go to great lengths to try to find some place where they they are allowed to express themselves. And anytime you hear a government official trying to convince you that they're going to limit your speech and limit your freedom so that they can do what's best for you, so that they can protect you, understand that they are only out for something worse. Understand that once you start down that road, there's no way back from it without absolute confrontation. People like that, they don't give up those kinds of powers. They don't they they want to manufacture them. They want to they want to put them into law in Canada. Obviously, they're not going to surrender them. So you have to tell them that you're unhappy about it. You have to tell them that you're not, they're not getting your support in any way, shape, or form so long as they support those bills. Now, Christine Van Ryn from the Canadian Constitution Foundation shares this approach, uh, shares this opinion. And she was up here before the Heritage Committee because they're talking about freedom of speech and they're talking about how they want to censor the whole Canada to make everybody feel like they're going to somehow be better off, but they're not going to be. Frankly, the government does not need more means. The government needs to do less. We already have the right to freedom of expression guaranteed in Section 2B of the Charter. Before the Charter, we had the right to freedom of expression protected in the Constitution Act 1867, which is similar in principle to the United Kingdom, whose unwritten constitution protects the right of public discussion. We are not granted these rights to freedom of expression by our government. We possess them by virtue of being human beings. And throughout human history, it's the government that's the greatest threat to our right to free speech. Governments have tried to censor speech that they don't like as long as we have had governments. And it's hard for me to even know where to start on this question. Do I talk about the threat to freedom of the press, the problem with imprisoning people for words alone, the problem with using human rights tribunals to regulate art and comedy, or as Dr. G brought up, how professional regulators are undermining the right of freedom of speech of so many Canadians in those professions. These are all real, live issues today, and the source of the problem is government. And the source of the problem is government. I mean, I think that that is pretty encapsulating. And what she was talking about is how under Section 13 of the uh, Human Rights, the people could bring comedians and artists and priests in front and say, oh, what he said hurt my feelings. Your feelings are not relevant. You know, as long as the individual is not trying to say to you that they're going, like, if it's not a threat... You don't have the right to tell them not to say it. I mean, where does it end? Where does it end? Think about all the all the times out there you've been in, say, in a relationship and you're afraid to open your mouth. How well did that relationship work out? I'm sorry, but the fact of the matter is, is that the individual can say what they want. It's how you it's how you allow those words to touch you that that you need to work on. It's about you listening to it, not about them saying it. Now, as any Canadian will tell you, the press in Canada is bought and paid for. There's no such thing as uh, looking out for the common man or the investigative reporter. Those are gone by the wayside because of the corporations telling their reporters to only do softball news and to only ask certain questions and to say that if you're not in our group, then you're not part of our collective. You're not allowed to, to ask any. You're not even allowed to get in the room with the people that you need to be asking these questions for. On free press, consider the free the Alberta press case, which involved a law that compelled newspapers to publish government rebuttals to criticism. That case was from 1937. So fears about the so-called fake news or misinformation are not new. 
And while not censorship in the classic sense, millions of Canadians have lost access to news because of this government's Online News Act done in the name of saving the news industry. The act has backfired spectacularly with Meta refusing to comply and blocking news on its platforms. There's the Online Streaming Act brought by this government, which put the CRTC in charge of regulating content from companies like YouTube, Netflix, and Spotify, including user-generated content content and the free press is essential it's an essential check on the authoritarian impulses of government and the actions of this government continue to undermine it she mentioned a she cited a case from from the 30s where the alberta government made a newspaper run you know in those days running a newspaper took a lot it was a lot more time consuming right setting up a web press is is a little bit complicated So if you ran a story in the paper that was, you know, somehow deemed to be negative by the government, they they had the right to put in a rebuttal in the paper free of charge. She had that struck down the, well, I say she, but I mean the organization. I don't know the ins and outs of it. I just know that the real historic case in Canada is Joseph Howe. He's the guy that was threatened by the Nova Scotia legislature that they were going to execute him for words that he put in the newspaper that was deemed to be, uh, well, ultimately it was deemed to be appropriate, but the charge was seditious liable and they wanted to, like I said, they wanted to execute him. And he had the, you know, he showed that really what he was supposed to be doing was telling the truth and that's what he was doing because there was no, nothing in it that was false. So there was not, there was no crime to be committed and all they were trying to do was censor. Because it's always the people at the top that want censorship. It's never the people at the bottom. The people at the bottom are not telling themselves that they were, they're not even worried about that. But the people at the top, the ones that, are, that suffer the criticism of, of, you know, begging to be at the top. I mean, that's the price you pay. If you don't want to be criticized, if you should either find another line of work or do the right thing. I suppose it's a different video. Now, the truth of the matter is, is that as a content creator, C11 just like puts me under the thumb all the time. They are constantly turning down my stuff. I can see it in the algorithmic outputs that YouTube lets me view. I mean, they don't slow down. They fall right off the edge because somebody reached in and pressed a button, which I suppose, as many of you tell me, is a, uh, you know, a compliment. I mean, really, I don't believe that there is any free press that's corporate. The free press is actually the people that they want to call the content creators. The free press are the people that are talking about the issues of the day. Consider how expressing the idea that gay people should have equal rights was an unacceptable view 60 years ago, but thanks to the free speech of people who publicly advocated for change, we have equal rights now in Canada for the LGBTQ community. It is a nonpartisan right for all Canadians, yet this government continues to undermine it. One of the purposes of free expression is to allow for debate on even the most controversial topics because vigorous debate is how we best settle our disagreements, including disagreements about who should lead government. Free debate on contentious issues can't happen if the people currently in government are allowed to outlaw opposing point of views. The right to express your words and ideas goes to the core of who we are as individuals. The government doesn't need more means. It needs to stop trying to silence speech. Now, she said a lot there in that little bit of time. First of all, of course, it's our inalienable right to say whatever we want. And only through oppression can the government stop you from saying what you want to say. Now the government is trying to make words, fancy words, like misinformation and disinformation, but all they really are is just labels for things they don't want to hear. I mean, they have all of the the press, all of the, what you call mainstream media, legacy press, call it whatever you want. The corporate press is what I like to call it because they're taking their marching orders from corporations. They're taking their marching orders from groups that invested in them and bought stock in them. So it's a very small group of people who are who are telling these organizations how to run their uh, business. The people that are complying with doing that are also sort of just as guilty by association. Now, there was a time in Canada when it was illegal to be homosexual, which, you know, in stark contrast to Canada being one of the first countries in the world to marry 
people of that uh, of the LGB. And we can see that the only way that that was going to happen, the only way that those 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 rights were given was because you could walk and you could say what you wanted to say. I mean, I, I always laugh when I hear the people on the far left going, oh, it's virtuous. You know, they talk about virtue signaling. But the guy that was standing there telling you that you were going to be, you know, whatever, the, you know, all the stuff you might have heard of saying all those negative things or holding up placards, they also felt like they were being virtuous. They also felt like they had the right to say whatever they want to say. Which is, you know, the point that I'm trying, that's important to understand. You can't tell me what hate is. There's no definition for hate. And hate all of a sudden becomes what your mood is, what you want to hear. For every person that hates something, there's a person that enjoys it. And you can say, well, we're, we're not talking about, you know, hating ice cream or something like that. But it doesn't matter. Once you start to move the needle, the needle never gets stopped. The next person will come in with their frailty and they will continue to push it to the point where, you know, as soon as you say, oh, I don't agree with that, the RCMP is at the door telling you that you said something online and they just came here to talk to you about it. You know, six men heavily armed, wearing all kinds of equipment, who, all, who on the one hand will try to tell you that they are completely and utterly understand what it means to have the power dynamic while they stand there armed to the teeth. Of course, you can't expect these uh, politicians to agree to that because what they are really trying to do is get you to stop telling the, the world that you don't agree with their, with their behavior. They really want you to believe that if you hear it on the news, you're not going to understand that your life is in shambles. So now she's going to give her opinion on the bill C-63. Uh, and Ms. Van Gogh, I'd like to speak with you in particular about Justin Trudeau's censorship agenda, which has been implemented by the Liberal Party, certainly with help from the NDP. And when we talk about the censorship agenda, we're talking about primarily two pieces of legislation, Bill C-11 and C-18. I would add to that list Bill C-63, which has the potential to be one of the most censorious pieces of legislation that I've seen in a really long time. C-63, the Online Harms Act, would increase penalties for criminalized speech and hate-motivated crimes to life in prison, uh, it, which part of the concern around that is uh, using these heightened penalties to overcharge criminal defendants and uh, create pressure for plea deals for uh, lower level offenses when there is uh, an argument that the that the crown might make that there is a hate element even if it's not present it can be charged and uh, this overcharging leads to pressure to plead out um, another concern we have about c63 is that it would allow for uh, someone who fears a future hate crime uh, speech uh, that they can request a judge to put conditions on the would-be speaker uh, things like an ankle monitor or even imprisonment and this is for for future speech that has not yet taken place uh, this is in incredibly incredibly chilling. Uh, C-63 would also create a civil mechanism for people to complain about speech to the Human Rights Commission. Uh, it's a return of Section 13 of, of the Canada Human Rights Act, which was rightly repealed for uh, dragging before the commission uh, journalists and members of the clergy. Uh, there is no cost to bringing a complaint, but there's great cost to the complained about. And we have seen human rights tribunals uh, bring uh, claims, uh, bring bring before them comedians. Uh, that, that's in a Quebec context. So this, giving this power to these commissions will chill expression. Uh, I, I did not have time in my five minutes to, to mention C-63, and I know, I understand that there is a separate committee hearing that will address that, but I wanted to put on the record our, our serious concern about, about that. Uh, with respect to uh, the Online uh, News Act and the Online Streaming Act, uh, while perhaps not censorship in the most classic form, I do share the concerns of millions of Canadians who have lost access to news uh, as a result of the uh, Online News Act. I share the concerns of a lot of academics uh, and Canadian content creators about the regulation of 
user generated content on social media platforms uh, like YouTube. I'm a, a YouTube creator myself. The government in our country, the liberal government, is enacting blasphemy laws like we were living in the Middle East. It's ridiculous. You want to put people in prison for an arbitrary concept. You can't tell me what hate is. You can't tell me how come, you know, you can't say some words, but you can say other words, or you want to tell yourself that if you're a certain group, it's okay to say a word, but if you're not with another group, that's not how the world works. That's not what freedom looks like. That's not what equality looks like. You have the right to speak your mind. You don't have the right to threaten people and you don't have the right to lie. Those are not the same thing. And many people will try to conflate them, especially weak arguments, people who are like, oh, well, what if I this, what if I that? Come on now. The fact that you can criticize is, is something that if you can't hear criticism, then you need to sort of turn the, put the internet away and go find out why you're so frail. You can't protect yourself by giving the individual the right to be emotional and to lash out and say, oh, this person might say something. What kind of absurd dystopian concept is that? And who do you think will be the greatest implementer of the person might say something? I'm thinking the federal government. I'm thinking the school boards. They're the ones that are going to be trying to run around and utilize this to, as, a, as a gag on anyone that doesn't agree with their, with their policies. On anyone who, who, who dares, who deigns to speak up and say, no, I don't agree with you. And I have that right to disagree with you. But you can't convince them that, that you have that right because they're just so obsessed with having it their own way. The narcissism is at a brand new level. And of course, they want to implement things by, they feel like if they can scare a few, then they'll get the rest of everybody else to fall in line. That's why she said the overcharge, because if you're looking at 15 to life, 15 to 25 years for saying, you know, words, not even words that are mean, they're just words that other another person didn't agree with. And then they go in and say, well, we're going to give you 15 years unless you plead right now, and then you'll save everybody time, and we'll, only, we'll, we'll argue it down to a year and a half. That's how it works. That's the, that's the, the way the criminal court system works. And who has the money to pay for the lawyer? Nobody. When you're talking about a lot of money. Never mind the specialized lawyer that comes in front of the Human Rights Commission. You figure you got one of them kicking around every street corner? So, of course, this gives too, way too much power and it, and it makes too many people vulnerable. And why? What I want to understand is who is the individual that framed this? Who is this elected person? member of parliament who's supposed to be leading the country sitting around in a room having coffee saying you know what we should do we should make it so that they have to they can they can be arrested for something they might say who votes for these people honestly mp kirk asked her a question and she made a great analogy about c11 uh, i would however miss van gein bill c11 I, I do. I, I do have issues with C11. Uh, in particular, the ability of the CRTC to regulate user generated content that I think is the biggest concern. Um, the analogy that a lot of us who are online content creators, Canadians have given is if a bookstore is ordered by the government to put certain books in the window and certain books at the back, would we view that as a censorious government act? And that is the analogy that a lot of us in that uh, ecosystem have been using related to what the C11 uh, CRTC power to so if put its thumb on the algorithm is doing. Sharing news is not a, a threat to the news industry. Sharing news is only a threat to the government, not to the news industry. And... We have to understand that when when Facebook made that decision, it was because there were, there is no money being made by Facebook. It's the other way around, not when it comes to news. People go on Facebook for whatever reason that they do, but they don't go on there to get their news. The, 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 the difference is that in Facebook, the government could pay money, CBC, CTV, Global, all these places, could pay money 
and that would end up forced in your feed, right? They would say, oh, look, you know, so every second, every third ad would be from some propaganda arm of the liberal government, liberal, of the federal government. And then they decided that they wanted to try to get rich because they they covet the amount of money that these other companies are making. But Facebook didn't make its money based on on news. Facebook made its money based on other forms of advertising. So did many of them. And I have to ask again, who elects these individuals? You have to scrutiny. You know, we need to be giving our, our elected officials more scrutiny. You need to understand who you're voting for, especially in the Canadian system. You're not voting for Pierre Polyev unless you live in his riding. You're not voting for Jagmeet Singh unless you live in his riding. You're voting for the individual that's in your neighborhood, in your riding. And what kind of person are they? How do they think? Do they want to attack your freedom of speech? Do they want to cram you into a cookie cutter shoebox and not allow you to drive a car? Are these the kind of people that you want running the life that you live around you? Are these the kind of people that you're entrusting to look after things that are important to your life, especially when they fall to pieces? And I know that it may seem not germane to this particular video, but could I have said that? if the government was deciding that that was something that they didn't want the people to hear? And can we not look at any of three dozen countries in this world right now where the criticism of the government is in fact illegal? And do we want to live in those countries? Or are the, do you feel like there's maybe, you know, a few hundred million people living in these countries that wish they could get here, that, that would love to be able to get here? I don't imagine there's too many people living in downtown Toronto going, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to emigrate to North Korea. So let's, let's try to remember the importance of freedom of speech and how without freedom of speech, we can't criticize the government and therefore can't say to them that we're unhappy with their behavior. We can't, we're unhappy with their actions. All right. I'm going to wrap here. I want to thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next time.